Yesterday, it was very beautiful, but I, I was like, it was also very strong to my heart, and I felt like it, it was opening, but also like I was, I was seeing the light, but the shadow. And um, I, I don't know if I have a question, but I, I want to, to share something that is hard for me in the last uh, year. I have um, um, repetition in my family of people that don't want to stay in this uh, world. And, and they go. Um, I have uh, my grandfather and some of his brothers, and now some um, aunts and aunt, auntie. I don't know how to say it. Yeah, uncle, yeah. uncle, mm -hmm. but a woman. And and, <clears throat> and the last year, um, it was something really, really, really near me. And I think it, it was one of my favorite persons. Mm -hmm. And she was 88, and it was very hard. Mm. Um, and it's like opening the heart, but also um, it's hard to deal with the things that you, uh, you, you have inside of you and all the questions. And also like, um, I was all, all, always a person, a happy person, dancing, singing, and I am, but- You're Brazilian. <laughs> I'm, I'm Portuguese. Portuguese, okay, that's <laughs> close enough. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm an actress, I'm a clown, I'm a musician, so uh, it was hard for me in the last year, like, who am I? And, oh my God, I was a little bit silly, mm -hmm. <laughs> living all these years, like, life is so beautiful, okay, I have this on the family, but it's okay. And last year was like, whoa. Maybe life, it's not the way I, I painted, and without that colors that I love to paint and dance. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a year past, so I'm a, a little bit more um, positive, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something also, sorry, I'm talking a lot. That's okay, it's okay. <laughs> it's something um, that we don't talk on life, like, mm. and in my family, it's a secret. We cannot talk about it, and it's too strong to talk. Yeah. and. It's really funny because I am struggling with the voice and I need to free it <laughs> in front of all of these people and also not to carry on to, to, um, with this all weight, you know, because I, for maybe some people, the word that I can't say it, <laughs> what I would say, like the suicide, maybe it's not so heavy as me. And so I want to not neutralize it, but mm -hmm. okay, that's part of life. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. And thank you for uh, feeling safe enough to say something here. And that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons why we do this, you know, because you can share that Everybody in this room knows what you're talking about. Everybody. We all have the same stuff. Maybe not as immediate as what you're feeling this moment, but there's not one person in this room who hasn't lost someone through one way or another. And there's not one person in this room who's not going to go one day. If we don't deal with it, if we don't find a way to live in a good way right now, day after day in this world, we're not doing what we should be doing. And we're not dealing with reality. Being happy all the time, that's okay, as long as it lasts. But if it's real happiness, it doesn't come and go. If it's not deep enough. So, when I was gonna kill myself, I was in the temple with Maharaji, and I was having a full on hallucination, nervous breakdown, completely out of my fucking mind. And he sent me, I, I, it was just starting. 
and he looks at me and said, read the Gita. Give him a, give him a Gita, a Bhagavad Gita. Go read, go sit in that, in that room and read the Gita. So I go into the room and I'm kind of like zombied out, right? And I open the book and I read, the soul is not born, it doesn't die, you can't cut it, it doesn't get wet. And then the book falls from my hand and in the floor in front of me, a smoky, black, gray, slow motion whirlpool opens up in the floor and I'm being pulled down into it and I can't resist, I'm just going. There's no thought, I'm just going. And just as I'm about to go into this black hole, somebody comes to the door and says, Krishna Das, what? <laughs> Maharaj is calling, okay. So I, I get up and I start walking towards the front of the temple and I see him and I start to cry and I, I fall in his lap basically and I'm just weeping, I'm just can't. I, I totally fell apart and he's sitting there absolutely quiet. He didn't move, which is very unusual. He was always throwing fruit, laughing, joking. He's just, and I began to feel this really deep, quiet space open up underneath all this horror. And then he starts to say, he starts to repeat the words I had just been reading. He said, the soul is never born, never dies. Yeah. And then he looks at me and says, what are you going to do, jump in the river? Ah! <laughs> the river was six inches deep. But I figured if I got my head under one of the rocks, you know, maybe it would work, you know? What are you going to do, jump in the river? Ha ha! And he laughed. You can't kill yourself. Worldly people don't die. Only Jesus died the real death. What? He says, he never thought of himself. He said, this world is the flow of attachment. One replaces another, one attachment replaces another attachment. Someone dies and people cry and they don't eat, but after a couple of days they're laughing and drinking again. The flow of this world, samsara is the flow of attachment. No attachment, no world. He was totally unafraid of whatever I was thinking I was going to do to myself. It didn't it didn't shake him, you know what I'm saying? He was like, right there. What are you going to do, jump in the river? Ha! Huh? <laughs> you think that's going to do it? <clears throat> and I said, I'm always thinking of myself. All I do is think about myself all the time. Hep! Attachment. You know, he just wasn't buying any of my bullshit, but he wasn't judging me. It was like he was just letting me just melt into that space with him. You're here. You'll always be here. Whatever happens in life, you will be here. Guaranteed. There is no place you can't be other than here. Don't be afraid. The fear is the killer. You can deal with anything that comes up because you're here and because you know you can. Yeah, it can get hard. So, big deal. It's hard. It won't always be hard. It wasn't hard yesterday. It won't be hard tomorrow. It's the fear. It's not so much the feelings, it's the fear of the feelings, you know. How will I deal with this? I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. You know. Fortunately or unfortunately, there's no place we can go. 
unfortunately. We'd like to wish there was some other place to be, but there is no other place to be. We're here, we'll always be here. So let's get it together and live a good life and be good to ourselves and be good to those with us who are in our lives and those who are more afraid than we are. We can comfort those people just by being ourselves. There's nothing we have to do. Obrigado. De nada. Hello. So earlier you mentioned you're not a therapist. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Thank you. Yeah. Hi. So I'm very sorry um, for a very personal question. Yeah. But um, I was wondering if you could kind of help me to feel good about the love that I have because. It happened to me that I fell in love with two people, and it's been quite a struggle for the last year and a half. One wasn't yes. enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not so easy, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's been um, a groundbreaking experience um, because I felt for the first time very whole because... Um, Yeah, I don't know, because it's a man and a woman, and it's, I don't know, just a very um, uh, personal experience, and it's been a rough ride with those two people. And um, we're now at a turning point where it's, um, yeah, maybe we shouldn't try so hard to continue, even though there's a lot, a lot of love. But for whatever reason, it just won't quite work, and I keep feeling more and more guilty and bad about the love that I have, um, even though it is really just that I'm a very happy, content person. I don't really deal with issues much. I mean, I do go to therapy <laughs> and all that, but um, I'm just wondering if I should just go and, and be alone and, and not kind of bring this suffering anymore and, and to keep fighting for the love because it's there. <coughs> I'm just in this like vicious cycle and I yeah, don't know what to do about it. And yeah, I don't know if you have an answer or any kind of soothing words uh, for that. But as a believer of love, maybe you can solve this conundrum of love. Uh, you say love so many times and I don't feel love when you say it. So. You don't feel love? No, I don't. F okay. We Nobody can tell you what to do. Certainly not me. But what I can suggest is that you listen very carefully to your heart and do what you feel you need to do for yourself. Do what you feel is best for you. If it means going being alone, I guarantee you it won't be forever. If it means recommitting to this relationship and trying to work it out, I guarantee you, it won't be forever. <laughs> But nobody can tell you what to do. There's no way to make life easier. For, we have to follow our own hearts. The whole spiritual path, as far as I'm concerned, is learning how to trust ourselves. And that's very, very, very hard to do. If I feel we, that I do that, but I'm a very stubborn person. I care a lot for people. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, <clears throat> yeah. You live in your universe, and your universe has works the way it works. So, all I'm saying is that it's up to you to find out what you need to do to make your life work the way you want it to. Nobody can tell you what to do. At least I can't. And nobody could ever tell me what to do either. I wouldn't listen. So if somebody says, sit down, I stand up. That's just the way I'm made. But I had to learn how to listen to my heart. When I started chanting with people, nobody was doing that that way. But I knew I had to do that, so I started to do it. Nobody told me to do it. I had to listen to what 
what I needed, what my heart needed. And that's what you have to do. Well, you don't have to. But it might be a good idea. So. I'm trying to find an option that doesn't suck at this point. But yeah. Everything sucks. <laughs> it's called samsara. I should have a t-shirt, samsara sucks. <laughs> Everything sucks out there. The only thing that doesn't suck is who we really are. What really lives within us, our own true hearts. We are love. You don't get it from somebody. You, you're using it as business. You're talking about business. Relationships are business. Somebody looks at you a certain way, you feel good. Somebody looks at you another way, you feel bad. That's business. Do your business. Enjoy. And if you're not enjoying, don't do it. But it, it doesn't matter. It's not this. You're never going to find what you want anywhere out there. Not with anybody or any relationship. Nothing will ever be enough in the outside world. Period. There's enjoyment, there's pleasure, and then it's over. And then there's pain. And then it's over. And then it's pleasure. That's the way it works out there. It's only in here that there's truth, that there's real love, that there's peace. Peace. Peace of mind, peace of heart is really underrated. Nobody, everybody wants bliss, but bliss. I want some peace. Really? Don't you want peace? Don't you want to be at rest, at ease? Then you have to find the place that, where it is. It's in you. When you stop grabbing that shit out there, and you, you, it's not that you can't participate in things. Of course you can. But if you need things to make you feel good, it's not going to happen. I mean, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, a week, a year, God forbid it goes on for five years before you find out that somebody's screwing around with somebody else. Then how do you feel? You spend five years investing in a relationship that's built on lies. That's no fun. Pay attention now. Thank you. It's up to you. It's not up to anybody else. <sighs> uh. I was channeling some therapist in the astral world. <laughs> Look, I just want to tell you, I'm not bragging, but I've been through this shit for 76 fucking years. And I, you know, we're all going through the same stuff. Come on. Aren't we? We're all going through the same stuff. And we go over it, we go through it again and again and again, and we bang our heads against the same wall again and again in the same place. Someday, I pray it'll be enough. <laughs> for me and for you too. Uh, I had a question. Okay. Uh, uh, first, uh, thank you for the sharing to Mel. Um, Hold the mic a little closer, please. Uh, thank you for the sharing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, perhaps, like for uh, Ram Dass, uh, psychedelics uh, played a, uh, a role in his uh, life, life journey. Sure. And I mean it in a positive way. Uh, it is positive, yeah. It is positive, yeah. Sure. And I was going to ask you, what role has it played in your life journey? Well, <clears throat> I was 17. I was, uh, I played basketball every day, all day, when I wasn't playing guitar. And then I took peyote. You know what peyote is? Yeah. And now we're here. 
<laughs> I don't see the, the guitar or the basketball. <laughs> um, yeah, no, peyote, you know, I, my friend brought these buttons, these cactuses from the Southwest, and cooked them up in my mother's kitchen. And boiled them and boiled them and it smelled like shit. It was so horrible. And she walked in from work and said, what's that? I said, oh, it's my friend's uh, experiment from college. <laughs> okay, and then she went up to her room and got drunk, you know, she didn't care. So yeah, but the thing was when I took the peyote, I knew what I was seeing was real. It was 100% more real than anything on Long Island, anything that I had ever experienced. I had no doubts. This is real. And so that's, that really changed, changed a lot for me. Of course, I couldn't find my way back there, though. You know, that was the problem in those days. Um, acid wasn't even really available at that point. It was kind of just before that. Here's a funny story. So when I was in college, <clears throat> a guy I knew in high school was selling acid. Pure Sandoz acid. It was still legal, even. I scored 10 hits from him. 10 tabs, 10 capsules. Beautiful little turquoise blue capsules. Anyway, okay. So, um, but when I had took the first capsule, I was in college. I was playing basketball. I had a job. I was going, I think I was going to classes. I don't remember, but I might have been. By the 10th one, I was halfway to India. So, I didn't see this guy for 50 years. At the 50th high school reunion, there he was, right? And I went up and I said, man, you know that acid I got from you? I took that first, I was almost in anybody, you know? And he looks at me and he says, really? I took thousands of hits and I never got off of Long Island. <laughs> so, the chemical is one thing, but there's also karmas involved, right? When Ram Dass went to India the first time, the reason he went, he brought a bunch of acid with him, and the reason he went, he wanted to find out what it is, because it had changed his life, but nobody could tell him what it is. So he gave it to everybody who wanted it, you know, the, the, the taxi drivers, the, 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 the rickshaw wallows, the, the sadhus, the chai wallows, everybody. Some people liked it, some people didn't. Then he's with Maharaji, and the first day he had this extraordinarily, you know, a total life changing experience, which you probably read about. But the second day he comes, and Maharaji says to him, You have some medicine? And he thought he meant aspirin or something like that. So he takes out some aspirin. Nay, nay, the yogi medicine. <laughs> yogi medicine? He must mean acid. So he takes, he had four hits with him of Owsley acid, the best acid there ever was. And he, he goes like this. Maharaji takes all four hits, throws them in his mouth, and they sat around all day and nothing happened. <laughs> nothing. There was no change at all in Maharaji. This was really big for Ram Dass. However, <clears throat> so when he came back to America, he would tell people this story. He told me the story. And he told everybody the story. Some people said, oh, come on, you know, he scammed you. He threw it over his shoulder or something. Nobody could take that much acid. He didn't believe that. But you know, there was this much doubt in his mind. So. Fast forward for like three years, okay? I've been in India for about a year and a half. Ramdas shows up and we're traveling around together. And we met Maharaji in Brindavan at his temple. We're sitting in front of Maharaji. And it's a very sweet space. And Ram, Maharaji looks around us and he said, when you were in India last time, did you give me medicine? Ramdas said, yes. Oh, did I take it? Uh, I think so. Oh, got any more? Yes. 
give it to me. So I'm sitting right next to Ramna. So, okay, this is not second hand. <laughs> so Ramna goes like this. And here's what Maharaji did. He, he took one pill and he goes. <laughs> four times. How much, how much was it altogether? It was enough acid to put a horse on the moon. <laughs> four full Owsley acid hits. Ramdas used to take a half or one at the most. So Maharaja took four. So then we're sitting around with him. All of a sudden, he takes his blanket and he pulls it up over his head like this. And then he opens it up, he goes. <laughs> like this. I had never seen a purple human being before. Ramdas literally turned purple. And later on, he said, I thought I killed my guru. I thought he didn't take it the first time and he knows I doubted him so he wanted to prove it to me now I've killed my guru you know that's what he was thinking he turned purple so after a minute Ram Maharaji just stops he said ah he laughed he said oh yogis have known about this for thousands of years for a yogi who knows God no poison can affect him and then that was it nothing happened um, but he used to say the yogi medicine can bring you into the room with Christ, but you can't stay. The only way to stay is love. So, got any acid? <laughs> Not with me. Okay. It's been a long time. I, I think if I took any acid now, like my arms and legs would fall off, you know, it's like a book. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to know how and when um, did you develop uh, the longing for a guru or Maharaji? I was born with it. I didn't know what it was, what it is. But nothing in my life made sense to me. <laughs> Certainly not my family. Nothing, you know. I was a happy kid, mostly, up until I got to be a teenager. Then, of course, being depressed was happy. But, you know, there was always something not there, missing in everything. And it was when I walked in that room where Ram Dass was sitting that that thing showed up. What about you? I'm still looking. Keep looking. I'm on the path. So. Okay. There's a lot of other places you could be today. The longing is a bitch. On one hand, it absolutely ruins your life. On the other hand, it saves your life. Because nothing is enough. You have this longing to be, to touch this place, to, to live in this, for it to be right. And nothing can make it right. It's just a matter, you know, you, you, you fall in love and it feels right for a while, and then it changes. Something good happens to you and it feels right for a while, but then it changes. What never changes is the real thing. It's always just here. And 
but we're too busy looking outside for things. Hmm? That's why we're human. So it's a good place to start or continue. Hello. Where are you? Uh, off to your left. Your left. Ah, hi. Oh. Hi, Katie. Um, you know, when you sing, uh, I hear something in your voice that helps break down doorways I've put in front of my heart and my experience of this world. Um, and you often say that it wasn't until you started to um, sing with people that to save your own ass. You know, you started singing to save your own ass. So in service, in a way, you saved yourself through service. Um, I was wondering if you could speak uh, a little bit about service on this so-called spiritual path or journey. <clears throat> we used to ask Maharaji, how do we find God? We figured, you know, he liked us. Maybe he'd tell us. He said, serve people. What? People? What does serving people have to do with God? That's how dumb we are. I am. We say, well, how do you raise kundalini? You know, kundalini. <laughs> you say, feed people. What? He never encouraged us to do anything for the sake of our own enlightenment, so to speak, enlightenment. He said, don't think about yourself. How do you don't think about yourself, all right? Love everyone, serve everyone, remember God. That's what he used to say. Don't think about yourself. Now, it's very hard not to think about ourselves. That's all we do. We wake up in the morning, we start writing, producing, and acting in the movie of me. Hello, where am I going? What am I doing? Do they like me? They don't like me. What should I wear? Is my hair okay? Am I too big, too fat, too small, too short? What am I doing? And then we, we write reviews, which we read and get more depressed. And the movie doesn't stop. We don't stop writing the movie of me. So it's only through some practice. When we're chanting, when we let go and come back, that's a huge thing. Every single time we come back, that's a big thing, really big thing. Because otherwise, we don't come back. You get born, graduate from high school, drink some beer, and you die. <laughs> and you're not here for a minute. But when we chant or do a practice and we come back, we notice we're gone, we've just come back. We're here for a second before we're gone again. So it's through the practices that bring, move us more deeply into our self, our true self, self our, our soul, our hearts, that the constant thinking about ourselves, thinking about the world in terms of how it affects me, how am I, this is this, that just, you can't, it's not, can't shoot it dead, you know, you just have to keep letting go. It's training, mind training, so to speak. And it happens gradually. And the weirdest thing starts to happen, you start caring about other people. Yeah, what a horrible thing. You know, and then somebody lays some shit on you and and instead of getting angry, you, you kind of look at the person and go, whoa, that's an unhappy motherfucker. And you don't take it personally. And that's not thinking about yourself. But it's, 
you can't stop it. You have to move more deeply. And then they go by themselves, the thoughts. And then the service becomes natural. We don't want to be the Salvation Army. It's horrible. They wear these weird uniforms. It's terrible. You know. But wouldn't, we, wouldn't you help somebody if you had the chance? We would, you know. I mean, somebody falls in the street. You, you can help them get up. You don't have to marry them you know, or take them home with you. But you can help them get up. That's enough. But there's a lot of things that we're f afraid of. You know, Bernie Glassman, who's a great Zen master, he, he took his robes off and <laughs> started wearing Hawaiian shirts and a beret and all this suspenders, weird stuff. Because he saw that no matter what kind of experience he and others had, they always came back. You always came back to this. And he began to understand that it was our fear that shut us down again and again and again. And so he would go, he created the Zen peacemakers, and they, they go all, everywhere. There's some problems and, you know, cultural problems and violence and try to get the sides. They go to the places that bring fear. Like he would take people into the, into the streets on homeless retreats in New York, and no money, no credit card. You want to read the paper, you pull it out of the garbage, you know. And you sleep in the park, you eat in a soup kitchen. These are, you know, for businessmen and people, you know, to go out and do this, it's scary. But it's that fear that keeps, keeps us in that endless cycle about thinking about ourselves, protecting ourselves, feeding ourselves, all in very, um, ultimately, unsatisfying ways. That's the problem. If it was satisfying, no problem. But it isn't. And that's the problem, or rather the situation. OK. It's getting to the time where we're not going to be able to sing anymore, but she's gone anyway. OK. Whew. Free at last. But we'll see. Um, yeah, hi. The mic's not on. There's a switch, maybe. Test. Test. Oh, better. There we are. So good evening. Um, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts about your whole life experience. Are we more guided or is there a possibility that we are guide our own lives? And is there a difference between feeling what we should do and be guided or thinking and trying to guide our own lives? I, I'm not really sure I understand it completely, but... Uh, Should I ask it another way? Okay. Sometimes, um, after years of any decision, decision, you feel, oh, that's why I did it, without knowing in the moment of the decision mm -hmm. why you're deciding it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... What is your experience in your life with your decision and your meeting this? An endless flow of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so One after the other. Just do it. Well, yes, one hand, just do it. On the other hand, you know, if you're imprisoned by habitual tendencies and bad habits, or you, you, just doing it isn't going to be necessarily very good. So there has to be some self-awareness, mm -hmm. some, some 
quieting down and and trying to figure out what you really want. Mm -hmm. And mostly you find out what you want by getting what you don't want. It mm -hmm. just works that way. So you have to live. That's the deal. Mm -hmm. And the more you live 100%, the more you find out what you want and what you don't want. If you hold back and never... One time I was in the jungle in India with a, a yogi who was 163 years old at the time. He died a couple of years ago. He was 180-something. So I was sitting with him one day, and he looked at me, and he made a face. And he said to me, you have to develop willpower. In Hindi, willpower is icha shakti. Icha is desire. Shakti is the power to realize your desires, to get your desire. And then I made a face. Like, what do you need that for? And then he made a face. Because he saw my face. And so then he did something inside of me. He showed me what he saw in me inside me. And then I made a face. And I was horrified what I saw. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't going after, I was hardly living. I was floating. I wasn't going after the things I wanted even. And there was a lot of reasons. Fear of being judged, fear of failure. What would people say? Blah, 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 blah. You know, all this stuff that we have. And it was, it was really a powerful moment for me. And in some ways it led to you know, singing with people eventually. Because I saw, there's just life. There's not spiritual life and worldly life. I got one life. If I don't live it, what, what am I doing? And I saw that the willpower, you know, if I don't go after the things I want in my daily life, the willpower in, the, in this, which spiritual life needs more willpower even more energy, more insight, and, and more directed attention. And it's not easy. And if I wasn't doing it here, that wasn't going to happen anywhere, right? So it was a really big moment. Another time he looked at me, and, and, this, is, and he goes, this is back in the 80s, right? I was doing nothing. He looks at me and goes, ah, you're going to be famous. So I looked up at him and I said, and rich. <laughs> and he laughed. <laughs> he laughed and he came up eye to eye, nose to nose. He says, famous. <laughs> hey, I took my shot. You know, if he could make me famous, he could make me rich. So, okay. How's our minds? Empty at this point. No, oh, no, there's a, there's a thought. Yeah, okay. Where, who's got the mic? Where's the mic? Here's one. Okay. One mind. Oh, two mics. Okay, good. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for coming. I'm happy to be here too. <laughs> good. Um, so it's a semi personal question. I. Uh, Are you a semi person? Yes. <laughs> okay. Then Half ask the me. question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so the last years sometimes have been rough, but opening. Mm -hmm. And um, I think your music played a big part for the opening. And so I found my way to Maharaji somehow through you, I guess. I don't know. That's just what I'm thinking now. But <laughs> um, And then I had a dream about a year ago. Um, where Maharaji was there and he said, stop following me, <laughs> don't, don't annoy me, like that, you know? That sounds like him. And, <laughs> and I thought, okay, this, maybe I just have to, uh, I just try to um, think about what does it mean and stuff like that. And then I heard you talking about that when guys like him actually appear in a dream, it's them. It's not just something. Yeah, that's what I, it's not something I personally know, but I've heard many times that we cannot create the form of a, 
of a real saint or yogi with our minds, that if we dream of them or even think of them, they are coming to see us. They are, it's their presence. Mm. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he used to say, go away, Jiao uh, is my mantra. So you're pretty close right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I went away for some, but then I said no. Yeah, well, we used to go too. We would go outside the temple, turn around and walk back, and he would let us. He never said go away again. He just said, if, as long as you went away once, you could come back. He didn't say go away for 10 years. He just said, go away. We went and we came back. Okay. That took a little while to learn, but we got it. Yeah. Cool, thank you. You're yeah. welcome. I get it. Yeah. He was so funny. One time, one of his devotees brought a friend of his who had another guru. And they come, they're sitting in front of Maharaji. Maharaji looks at the guy and said, why did you come here? At your guru's place, there's kirtan, bhajan, and everything's going on. Here, it's just ao, cow, jiao. Come, eat, go. That's what it was like. Come, eat, go. People would come like from long distances. You come, now go. He didn't need us to be there. He didn't need you to be there to, to help you to do what had to be done. He didn't need to be told anything. You didn't have to. It was maybe our lack of faith that made us tell him things. That we were, Baba, can you help me? Ba, 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 ba. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. So. Be in the presence of somebody like that is a great blessing. And um, But now it's over 50 years since he left the body. I, I'm closer to him now than I was when I was holding his foot. How does that work? So don't think that you need to look for something or someone outside of yourself. Because the real guru is not outside of you. And the real guru is always with you. But we have to learn how to pay attention. That's all. And that's all. And it ain't easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But it's easier than running through the jungle when it's 45 degrees out, believe me. So there was some other mind over there? Uh, here. Where? <laughs> I have... Oh, uh, hi. Okay. I, would like, I would like to thank you for sharing these stories about Maharaji and your um, time in India. And when I listen to these stories of you, I experience or I feel, is it... Um, that they freed you as a, the, in this, um, to be in the presence of this love. Is it um, that uh, this love freed you and give you the courage to, uh, to go to, through your stuff? Is it like this? <clears throat> yeah, it is. Because I struggle often to have courage to go through, as to go my way. Mm. Yeah. And I would like to thank you because um, I'm very lucky to find you on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I am. I'm not really here. I'm on YouTube. I don't know much about this whole thing, but um, it gives me a, a good feeling and uh, I come at ease. Thank you. That's very nice to hear. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. You know, one time I was sitting with Maharaji in a, an apartment in Mumbai and he was 
sitting on the bed, then he'd lie down, he'd sit up, he'd this way, that way, that. and I was just sitting on the floor doing my spiritual practice, which was basically just this. <laughs> just watching him move and do this and that. All of a sudden, after like a couple of hours, he sits up and he looks at me and he goes, courage is a really big thing. And the Indian guy there said, Oh, Baba, God takes care of his devotees. Courage is a really big thing. You know, there were times in my life where the, the, the vaguest memory of that moment was just enough to get me through something, you know. I didn't have any courage, but I remembered that moment, and that was enough, you know. Boy. My first thought was like, what's going to happen? You know? It happened. Sometimes you just have to, you know, sometimes you just have to do it. And it takes, sometimes it takes courage. Something's not working, you're stuck in something, you don't know what you'll do if this is over or what you're going to do next, but it ain't working. Sometimes you just have the courage to do it. So, courage is a really big thing. Hare Rama. Yeah, there's the mind I know over there. Yeah, now I have it. <laughs> uh, thanks for being here. It's very nice listening to you, and I'm very happy that we talk so long. Tell that to that lady, will you please? I, I will do it in German later. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> purpose of life. What's life? Can you describe that to me? I'd like to know what that is first. Okay, if I am born, maybe I will die one day, and in between. Most likely. Um, yeah. I do something. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I would call life. Yeah. I have no idea what the purpose of life is. I have no idea what my purpose is in life, but as I, you know, I don't know in a grander scheme of why we're here, why we, what we're doing, or anything like that. I don't know how we got here. I don't know where we're going. You better ask somebody else. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, another hand went up out of the blue back there. Yeah. It is a switch, you gotta turn it on. Hi, hello. Hello. It's a gift to be here today, thank you. I'm Hindustani log. Kup pagal hai. Aap ke liye pagal hai. <laughs> um, my question is that the last few years I witnessed a lot of suffering in, within my family mm. and a lot of conflict yeah. and it hurts me to witness that it, and my, intellectually I, I've accepted it and I understand that suffering is part of life like, like you said everything sucks um, but <laughs> It's not like I made that up. I know. <laughs> okay. I know, I get that. But intellectually, I understand that everything sucks and, you know, life is, is suffering, is part of life. But my heart hurts so much watching, uh, witnessing loved beings suffering and also like unexpected deaths of loved beings, people passing away in pain unexpectedly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I read all these things and I intellectually I'm able to process it, but my heart feels so heavy, heavy feeling, witnessing loved ones suffering. What do I do with that? Let it go. What are you going to do about it? Can you change it? No. The only thing you can change is your own attitude. You can see the suffering. You can wish it wasn't there, but it's there. And you could see that 
first of all, the pandemic times brings everybody who's eaten up alive by their own minds. Hey. Mostly people had not. For me, I hate to say it, I was happy as a pig in shit. Just, I was home. I, every Thursday night I got online, I was still wearing my pajamas. I was so happy. But I know a lot of people suffered a lot and created a lot of suffering for everybody in their lives. And that's unfortunate. What are you going to do? If you let it eat you alive, what, do you, what good is it? You have to be stronger. You have to be stronger. You can feel what you feel, but you can't let it destroy you. You can't. That's not fair to yourself. You can feel for those people. You can see what they're doing. You can love them. Loving someone also means letting them be who they are. Not who you would like them to be, not who you would wish them to be, but you can't, you can't change people like that. But if you love them, maybe somehow it creates a little space for them to let go of some stuff, but maybe not. What can you do? The best thing you can do for them is to, is to be in the best place you can be. Nothing else is possible, really. Right? I mean, what can you do? It's hard. And a lot, of, a lot of Indian people and people I know, you know, the families in India, whoa, it's intense, you know. In many good ways, too. Like one time I was sitting with Siddhi Ma in the back of the temple. And all the, 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 the grandchildren of this one gen, of my Indian parents, they all came in the family. The oldest grandchild was getting married. So all the cousins came and they were sitting back there. They came to the temple to see Ma because they all knew each other from in the, in the mountains. And I was sitting back there watching these kids. There was so much love among these kids. I was just sitting there. And she looked at me and she laughed and she said, you see, Krishna Das, you see what you missed by being born in America. <laughs> so, you know, there's wonderful positive things about Indian families. And then, of course, there's a lot of unhappiness, too. It's part of the show. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You can pray for them. You can beg, you know, you can wish everything you can do practice for them you can do pujas for them you can do everything but you can't change them you can only what all we can do, the best thing we can do for everyone is to make our hearts as wide as the world and with room for everyone to be inside of that as they are right now that's the most loving thing we could ever do is to let people live within our own hearts as they are, not as we want them to be. It's a big thing. Thank but, you. Yeah. I think we've exhausted the... Yeah. No problem. Hi. Hey, um, I have a question. Uh, what do you know or what do you think? It's uh, Have uh, Jesus Christ ever been in India? <clears throat> I have read about it. I think he's still there, actually. <laughs> he just took a temporary birth in that other, that other country. I think he's Indian, basically. You know, uh, there was a great yogi named Shiva Bala Yogi who I had met a few times, Shiva Bala Yogi. He was really a big time, beautiful Baba. And uh, he was in California. He came to America. And someone said to him uh, something about Jesus dying for our sins. He said, that's a bunch of shit. That stuff was written afterwards, later, you know. He didn't die for sins. He was a yogi. Nobody can touch a yogi unless he wants to go. He did what he did. It had nothing to do with dying for anybody's sins. It was really interesting. 
And then they said, will he reincarnate? Of course. He's already reincarnated a hundred times. He said, but he's not going to come, by like, come back like that. If he comes back like that, the same assholes who tried to kill him the first time will do it again. <laughs> so. Hare Ram. How are we doing, okay? Can we call it a night? We okay? No? Anybody? Come on, somebody raise their hand. You'll get shot by these other people who want to go pee. <laughs> okay, we really don't have time to sing now because it's almost 11. Um, thank you for coming and being here and opening up and talking and, you know, we're all sitting in the same stuff and we all have the same issues, the same stuff. Everywhere I go, I, I tell you, I, we do this in every country and every city. It's amazing. Everybody asks the same questions. We have the same stuff. We're in the humans. We're all in the same thing. And someday we'll be helping each other more than we are these days, I hope. Okay? Namaste.